Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and uh, I'm here today speaking with Misha Komarov. He's the co-founder of Nil Foundation. Uh, Nil Foundation is basically working on a marketplace for zero-knowledge proofs. So we're going to dive into what Nil Foundation is, a zero-knowledge proof, zero-knowledge proof market. Uh, I think this is one of the areas where there's been a lot of interest, a lot of buzz about it, right? There's a lot of investment in this area. And uh, yeah, so really excited. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us, Misha. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So, you know, I just mentioned, right, like, okay, a lot of like ZK um, interest happening now. Now, an interesting thing about Neil Foundation is that you guys actually started in 2018. And, uh, and you know, it says uh, on the website kind of that this initial focus was on be- sort of best practices for, you know, database management systems for crypto. And so I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about how did this get started? Like, what was the original vision for Nil Foundation? And, um, yeah, w- what is this database management system? Why is that important? Okay. So let's go into that. Basically, the reason uh, why Null Foundation was started is because prior to that, it's like uh, me and, uh, well, it's like Kostya, it's like we were together doing a fork of uh, Stimit, basically like European dedicated fork of Stimit. And I was kind of a fellow who was responsible for all the technical part in there. And uh, it's like, from my perspective, I was dealing with all the technical issues, with all the data management issues. And I... I literally, it's like I was, I was literally like in pain by the absence of proper data management tools back then. And well, it's still kind of absent, to be honest. Uh, like people still struggle with like accessing Ethereum data and yada yada. So uh, I was, I was struggling with the absence of that. And considering that all the Stimit stuff and all the Colas stuff was actually kind of a social network and something, something you, you obviously were required to have, you know, proper data management. I mean, like proper one, just like they do in traditional, in traditional web industry. So we had no such, such a thing back then, and we still have no such a thing. So I was like, so in April of 2018, I was like, hey, Kost, let's go do a DBMS, right? I mean, I don't want anybody to struggle that. I don't want to struggle myself. I don't want anybody to have that issues. So that's what it was. Right. So, so this would be like, okay, you want to have a database where like you store in there, I don't know, these are all the users, these are all the posts, and then like use that information to serve a web application. Yeah. Yeah. Since it was required for such a database to work in untrusted environments, like to be basically BFT compliant, right? So it's like database for crypto, right? So I had to, so, 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 so we had to think about how to mix these two industries together to make it, to, to make it basically, to make it basically work. To make it to make it suitable for hosting BFT protocols for hosting BFT applications. So yeah, that's what it was. That's that was the idea. To merge two industries together. Yeah. And and then because the idea with this uh databases were basically I, I'm I'm curious if you can expand it a little bit more on this aspect of have the database be trustless. Did you kind of imagine that the user would have some way of verifying that, you know, the database functioned in a particular way and, you know, sort of serve the results in the right way. That's one of the critical components, because if you want, if you want, uh, if you want like the, the DBMS or like the database to work in untrusted environments, you've got to be able, you've got to be able to verify what's going on in there. I mean, you can't just like go and access, for example, somebody's data, like Ethereum's data or like some rollups data or like some other protocol data, something, something, whatever. Uh, you can't just come in and, uh, you know, and trust what, what, what has been given to you. Because I mean, this database could, could easily just, you know, screwed you. And, uh, this, 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 this can result like in something very nasty. So basically it is required and it was required to make the interaction with this thing as trustless as possible, because I mean, like one more trust point, come on, we don't want to be that trust point. All right. <laughs> so we do not want to have that responsibility on our hands. So. Basically, to make it as trustless as possible, it was required for people which operate over some data inside this database or through this database, like over Ethereum's data, for example, right? It was required to make it to make them capable of uh, like verifying whatever they have done. And for the sake of this, it was required to have an it's like it's like a, like, a, like provable execution environment, right? And uh, so that's basically the desire. And uh, how, how to do this like provable execution environment? It's like you also, it's like beside the people, it's like how to do this. I mean, you got to prove somehow what was executed. 
And the most, the, it's like the, the most convenient, the most suitable thing which we had back then was some like modification of growth and, uh, you know, some theoretical constraint system uh, based proof systems. Uh, so that was the best fit back then. And we were like, um, it's not sufficient. It's not good. And we would need much more than that. So we started working on a cryptography suit with embedded proof systems in there. And uh, once we realized that, okay, it's like we got, it's like the industry got to that point when there is when there is enough uh, of like tech and theoretical research available to make such an executable environment, uh, we were like, okay, well, long, it's like long cache proof systems were introduced. We got them longer, but we got them implemented in the cryptography suit of ours. Another question arised. It's like the second question which arised is that besides just proving the execution of whatever was done with the data inside the database, you got to prove that the data which was taken as an input to this database was basically taken from the right place. Because otherwise, I mean, how can you be, how can you be sure that the data that you're operating over wasn't, you know, just made up out of nowhere? That it's actually, for example, Ethereum's data, right? So th for the sake of this, we needed state and consensus proofs. And... Uh, that's how we got together basically with the Zero Foundation, with Mina Foundation, with Solano Foundation guys, because that was like our that was like our desire to do state proofs and consensus proofs. And they were like the only ones which had any idea about this, about this back then. And uh, once we got this, once we got together in 2021, this collaboration of ours evolved into the birth of ZK Bridges. I mean, like so many projects are building ZK bridges now, right? So, but like back then it was, back then it was like, hey guys, we need state proofs. You know how to do them. We want to learn. Let's do something together. So that was basically the, like the origins of ZK bridge in general. So that's, that's like what it was. So, and uh, when we, it's like, it's like in the, pro in the process of doing all that, uh, we were like, yeah, well, it's quite a lot of circuits. I mean, like very, it's like too much circuits, right? And they're very complicated. And we don't want to do that like manually anymore because we've spent like a couple of years before that already like crafting those circuits. And uh, we were like, nah, we're not going to do that. I mean, probably somebody else has this kind of problem. So we need a compiler for that. Let's just do a compiler for that. So we took LLVM. I mean, like just, just, just a compiler, like which everybody uses. It's like, you know, very solid. And uh, we just took it. We made it provable. So that's how ZK LLVM was born. I mean, because because we were like sick and tired of building circuits like manually, and apparently the rest of the market was also sick and tired of doing that. And the proof market is basically uh, it was born it was born out of our realization that all of those state proofs, consensus proofs, and state transition proofs we worked on for the sake of you know making this as transparent and tr as trustless as possible uh, were really heavy, and uh, we were not willing to make like you know anyone to generate it themselves. And we will, it was like, we, 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 did, we didn't want to generate it ourselves. So we were like, okay, well, we'll just make a marketplace since, uh, since, yeah. So, and, uh, basically, and basically we just slapped the marketplace on top of the same database we were doing. And, uh, we were like, okay, well, we were building a database. We tried to make it as trustless as like, you know, as transparent as possible. So we'll just slap the proof bucket on top of it. So this could also become like, you know, decentralized and like distributed, whatever, 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 like for proof generation. That's what it was. Cool, cool. No, I think that was very helpful. Actually, I, I think what would be great to talk a little bit about, and, you know, I mean, I think for some, many people, this will be familiar, and for other people, it's it's still kind of like maybe a little bit new, but it's like, the, um, it's not of the, like, use cases for ZK tech, right? Because w w what you mentioned, right, basically, okay, you want to have like this provable, you want to have some code, right? And that's like provable. So of course, like sort of an obvious thing would be, well, you just use a blockchain for Ooh. it, right? Put it on the blockchain. It's not that simple. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, I guess a bunch of the big downsides of that would be, well, now you have consensus. So like your database is going to be maybe limited by the speed of consensus, right? And then the scalability and cost would be much worse exactly. and then maybe some other things might be yeah let's say if you want to have you know private data some off-chain thing being done uh let me expand on that it's like you're absolutely right when you're absolutely right when you're talking that uh okay of course you can prove your competition just putting it on uh, just putting it inside some protocol and you know just computing that but there is a nuance that you can only compute uh inside such a protocol in, so with such a protocol you can only compute uh, something which uh, which doesn't have uh, which doesn't have 
a lot of like communication complexity. Because like when you come to communication complexity and when you when you need to compute something really big, or like or really so, something really complex, right? It's like the problem. The problem with all that with all that protocol based co computation is that you get basically limited by by the communication complexity that you gotta be, that you gotta basically um, split the piece of computation you want to do to level parts to deploy them separately, then to make them communicate between each other. And this introduces a lot of overhead, so you get kind of limited. And uh, that's not really that's suitable when you have when when this when this computation is decomposable, right? There's it's, it's like uh, there is uh, there is like a very traditional trick in the DBMS world when you need to compute something over data. It's like currently it's like what people do currently, right? Like for example in Ethereum, it's like people just do people just do basically like synchronized computation like over some transactions over like some I don't know replication packets and that's like across all of those nodes, right? So a traditional trick in DBMS industry to overcome this is to introduce like dynamic sharding, but that's still not enough. I mean, it's like we realize that it's still kind of not enough. In case you cannot decompose the computation you want into little pieces, which would not introduce com uh, communication complexity hard enough, you know, like large enough, or like you know big enough, you know, to kill the whole efficiency, to kill efficiency at, like at all. So when you have a big chunk of computation which cannot be decomposed, you got it, and it's easier, it's cheaper, it's faster to compute it somewhere, and then just to put the result of this computation to some protocol where you can operate with this results in uh, like, you know, decomposed manner and, uh, and, and basically like, you know, so with small chunks. So that's what basically, that's what basically it is about. So we tried to cover, so we basically tried to cover, we knew that it would be required, like not only us, the whole industry does this, right? It's like, we, it's like we knew that it would be required to be able to cover uh, decomposable computations, which do not introduce a lot of computational complexity. It's like, you know, for this, basically, and that's, that's why we introduced kind of sharded to the DBMS because it's traditional. We just brought it in here. It's like, okay. And uh, to cover the piece of computation which is not decomposable and which is not better to be decomposed, which is just simpler to be computed somewhere and then to be proven and then to be like used uh, on some, I don't know, Ethereum or like whatever. Anyway, uh, that's what for the combination of a proof market plus compiler exists. It's basically like a marketplace for provable computations which cannot be decomposed. That's what it is. So that's when it makes sense. And that's when it makes sense to use ZK proof systems for this kind of computations. You mentioned like circuits and you mentioned, um, you know, CK LLVM, right? So now like, please correct me if I'm understanding here is, is correct, right? Because like, let's say you have like some computation and you say, oh, you want to prove this computation. And then circuit basically means, okay, you, you develop a bunch of like equations, no? To then check this particular computation. So somebody else can then check that. And then if it's something like the ZK LLVM, you then just do that for, you know, any code that's written using that VM. And then you can just verify anything written uh, on this VM. Is that kind of? It's uh, not really because again, it's like nil is again being weird, right? In here, so basically, what's going on in the industry currently? It's like obviously, yeah, there are people which do custom circuits, which do custom circuits with libraries for each particular application. Like, uh, like I don't know, Scroll did that, right? For example, they did very custom, uh, pretty good circuit. I mean, really good circuit for ZKVM. They've built over like I don't know, a couple of years, and that's pretty good. They used Halo 2, it, it works, it's fine, and uh, all right. That's how it was done before. Then uh, people have started realizing that you can actually not to craft a custom circuit for each particular piece of computation, but to do just one circuit of some virtual machine, and then to put the bytecode of, 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 of the computation you want to prove as an input to the circuit, and then to prove this computation via this like you know enormously big-ass VM circuit, all right? The problem which this thing, which it's like the problem which which two, these two approaches introduce is that um, for for example custom circuits, it's very expensive and very very like troublesome to write them, right? To implement them and to implement them properly is even harder. I mean, like even Vitalik complains about that, and that's you know that's the valid that's a valid concern. It's like in case for example some roll up or something, it turns out that custom circuit they wrote is under constraint 
or it's just, you know, it just wasn't audited properly or something, something, somebody forgot something like, just please don't forget anything, guys. <laughs> If somebody, if somebody forgot something in some circuit and they turned out to be under constraint, somebody will be able to prove uh, to Ethereum what actually didn't happen on Wall. And then we will, we will all get fucked. <laughs> so that would be really bad if, somebody, if this happens. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that's like the problem with custom circuits. You can't know what's going on inside. It's really complicated to, to, to craft them. It's really complicated to know what's going on. It's really, it's really hard to make them secure. The nuance with VM circuits, with just one with just one VM circuit, is that you introduce an enormous overhead. So basically, the overhead with, for example, like custom circuits, it's like and VM circuit and, and VM based computation, ZK VM based computation, is usually like at least ten times, at least ten times in terms of cost and time. So this is very again like introduces like a lot of overhead. What is at least ten times? It's like, it's at least 10 times, it, it's like the complexity in terms of like approximation, in terms of a circuit size, in terms of the amount of computation you need to prove. It's like, for example, let's say you want to prove A plus B, right? So if you do a custom circuit for it, it's going to be very simple. It's actually going to be like, okay, let's just prove A plus B. You lay out this an equation and you're like, okay, well, this is error for size. This, this here, here goes the representation of it and we're good. If you do A plus B, uh, it's like with the ZKVM circuit, you basically prove uh, not just A plus B, but you prove the execution of the whole CPU plus everything, 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 like all the byte codes, everything, 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 opcodes, a shitload of opcodes, which do in the end A plus B. So that's, you know, just an enormous overhead for doing just A plus B. We kind of knew that we're not going to go with this overhead. So we chose the way, as, we, as they say, in the middle, which uh, basically, which basically uh, about introducing custom circuits for each particular piece of program, yes, but not manually, but generating that automatically via compiler. So you can still prove mainstream languages. You can still prove, I don't know, like Rust, Solidity, CPP, anything you want, but it's going to be custom circuit for each particular part of computation. There will be no overhead. And in the same time, you do not craft those circuits like manually. So it's basically like right, something in the middle. That's what it is. And, and how are these uh, automatically generated? These custom circuits compiler. That's where our compiler comes to comes to the stage. That's what it is about. Okay, so the compiler is basically like a program that will take something like okay A plus B and then put out a custom circuit for it. Yeah. Or for example, if you want to prove something really big, you want to prove some I don't know like ML model or learning or something, something, you just put it in there and there will be a custom circuit generate for it. So there will be no overhead, but in the same time, you could, you could use the code, which was already written by, I don't know, like thousands of people out outside of the industry, for example, or I don't know, game. If you want to prove the game, let's say you want to, you want to, let's say you want to prove that you speed run some game in some particular time, or right? I like do my favorite example, do speed run. So you can actually just put the doomed code inside the compiler, compiler, compile a circuit for it. And then to brag to your friends, like, hey, I've proved that. It's like, I, I, I can speed run with this amount of time. Beat me. Here goes a proof like, of it on Ethereum. So <laughs> that's what it is. That, that's me. That makes it doable, basically. And so with this compiler here, I mean, I mean, I guess there's all kinds of different things that people may want to verify, right? It could be like maybe Solidity code, or it could be code on, I don't know, Solana or like some other blockchain, or maybe some code that runs, you mentioned uh, machine learning or you know, something else. So it, this compiler, then it can basically take any kind of code and output these custom circuits or like, yep. so any arbitrary programming language you can basically use for that. It's like any programming language which is supported by LLVM, and there's quite a lot of compilers written for LLVM. For the, like there were there were a lot of compilers written for LLVM for the last 20 years. So that's pretty much like, yeah, that's quite a lot of languages. It's like just in case, fun fact, it's like we have like an internal joke that you that you that you can actually produce a zkVM via zklvm. <laughs> you can, so you, you can take basically, for example, EVM interpreter, for example, EVM one, right? It's like classic EVM interpreter, which is like, which was around like since, I don't know, 2016 or like 2017, right? And you can just take it, you can, you can compile it to a circuit. So you, so you would get a ZK EVM circuit as an output of it. 
is here as, as an output of a circuit compiler. So <laughs> something like this, yeah. Maybe one thing we can touch on briefly is this like a little bit of a detour potentially. I mean, people in crypto, right, many people have been sort of aware of CK tech for a long time. But I guess the main project, right, where we've kind of known ZK tech through is Zcash. You know, basically said like, okay, we're going to take, you know, do something like Bitcoin, but, you know, give people basically the ability to make transactions uh, privately. And then, you know, there's still these proofs, so you can kind of know the whole thing is safe and correct, but you don't know who's sending what to whom. So the privacy thing was, you know, I think for a long time, the the kind of main way that people thought about ZK. And yeah, now, now a lot of it is more around this other use cases, right? Like roll-ups or like where, where you basically say, okay, you can run this computation. We just use proof. And so it's much more efficient because like maybe you have to run less things on chain. But let's touch on privacy briefly. What are your thoughts on like ZK and privacy? Um, is there much activity? Do you think, like, how do you think it's going to play out? Okay. Yeah. See, it's like uh, privacy applications of proof system is something which was traditionally supposed what this what this is for until recent times. I mean, that's uh, that's true. And uh, it's like. To understand, to understand if there is a way forward with this, if there is like, if there is like any, you know, light in the end of the tunnel, right, with privacy and the, with with zk, like for privacy, is like we gotta understand how this privacy is achieved. For example, like for zcash, right? For for z, so for zcash, privacy with zk is basically achieved as follows, because it's like you have some data which is kind of encrypted and stored inside 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 zcash 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 protocol zcash like database whatever. So what's going on is that you basically, when you want to do like a transfer of Zcash, you get the data from there, encrypted one, you decrypt it, you pro you post a proof of a successful decryption in there, you do some changes with this data, you, then you encrypt it back, you, you do the proof of a correct encryption and you post it back to the cache. I mean, like it's a high level, a high level overview of like, how does that work, right? And uh, the, what you've noticed in here most probably is that privacy is actually being uh, preserved not by you know proof system itself, but by simply the fact that the data never leaves the never leaves uh, the 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 device of basically you know user, like just user. It's like it's like the decrypted data is only available in user's machine, and uh, the user is not willing to disclose that is not interested to disclose that. So that's how the privacy is achieved. So there is a nuance. It's like there is a question: Can you store some large amount of data in the database and still be able to get it each time from a protocol to your machine, decrypt it, do something with it, and then encrypt it, and then post all of these proofs of correct encryption and decryption? It's like, will you be able to do that with large amount of data? That's a good question, and uh, I haven't seen anybody willing to download I don't know like petabytes of data on their phone. To just decrypt it, do some small change, and then encrypt it back again and send it back. It's not like it's, um, you know, like very practical. So to defeat this, to defeat this, basically people started people started thinking about okay, we need to process this data right where it is, right inside the database. You don't have to do so. You won't need to download it or like do something with it. And that's where basically that's where basically like with the most encryption came into came into play. And it's still in the lab. It's still not out there. It's still not usable. But once it is, I think in terms of privacy, it will become much more relevant than proof system based mechanisms. Proof system based mechanisms are very good for compression. I mean, those use cases which we see right now, like DK bridges, ML, rollups, I mean, whatever, oracles, anything, anything, right? Gate, DK gates. Very good for compression. But for privacy. It, all right. So uh, let me, the, so that was very interesting. Let me just sort of like rephrase if I understood this correctly. Basically, like the, the issue is that, you know, in a proof system privacy, yeah, you know, I would basically need to run it locally, right? So I'm going to have to download some data from somewhere. I do whatever I do, and then I generate this proof on my phone or my computer, and then I send this proof back, and then, and then that's the change. But of course, the downside here is, well, I have to download this data. I don't know if the maybe 
generating the ZK proofs is also um, computationally. Sometimes it is, yeah. Right, and then and then with homomorphic encryption, basically the advantage is that they can have the data, someone else can have the data, and they can apply the computation on top of this data, but everything's encrypted, so they don't know actually what the data is, but you know, I don't have to be involved as a user. Yeah, it's like, this is the way. Yeah, okay, and so you feel like homomorphic encryption is the thing that's really going to help sort of the, the privacy applications more than the proof systems. Yep. So it's, it's like, again, proof systems are very good for compression, for data structure preserving compression. I don't think any other thing will beat this. But in terms of privacy, yeah. L let's talk about the marketplace. Can you explain um, how does the marketplace work, the ZK marketplace? And, um, you know, like who are the different actors that are participating in this marketplace? Basically, what Proof Market is in terms of like, you know, protocol architecture. So uh, what is that? It's basically, again, just a, market, a tech marketplace for proof generation, right? It basically turns all those like ZK proofs into commodity, which you can like measure, it, measure, measure their value, measure their generation time, measure how much they would cost to be produced or how much uh, it would cost to, I don't know, like speculate with them. We had thought which we're actually speculating with them. So anyway, so uh, that's that's basically what it is. What are the actors in there, and uh, what are the actors in there? Well, let's start with like the most obvious one. It's like uh, generators. I mean, this is nothing without proof generators, right? So these are the fellas with uh, these are the fellas with like you know big machines or specialized hardware or something else, which are willing to provide uh, their computational facilities for the sake of, you know applications being able to use them for their for this, like for the sake of for the sake of security of theirs, for example. Sometimes it's not security, sometimes I get it's compression or something, something. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the most critical component of this whole thing. Uh, the nuance is that uh, different different participants, different proof generators induce basically, uh, induce basically uh, like open competition. I mean, obviously it induces open competition because somebody has a better hardware, somebody has worse hardware, and somebody is more fitted to generate, like, for example, roll-up circuits, like groups for roll-up circuits. Somebody is more fit to generate, like, I don't know, groups for ZKML circuits or something. So it creates an open competition. To, to coordinate this open competition and to make sure that it stays fair, uh, there's basically like a coordinating protocol. Like, coordinating like protocol application, right? Application on top of DBMS thing. So the second, the second actor, uh, which is the most obvious one, is basically is, is basically the fella who maintains uh, maintains uh, the maintains the maintains this cluster, maintains this protocol, maintains the DBMS. I mean, because currently it's just it's, it's just what it is. You got to store the data, you got to facilitate the competition, you got you, you have like a competition, and you got to make sure that it stays fair. So that's what it is. Uh, there is a nuance on the, how this competition designed internally in terms of like protocol architecture and what is required for that. But that's like, you know, different, def different topic. We'll come to that later if you want. But the third uh, obvious participant of this is basically like application. Well, it's uh, the most obvious participant. It's like locations, I don't know, like ZK bridges, ZK oracles, like rollups, I don't know, ZK ML stuff, anyone, ZK games. It's, uh, it's about, so how does it look like for them? It's basically, in most cases, this is like theory, this is a theorem application. It's like and rollup is also kind of a theorem application. We consider it that way. So in most cases, this is like an Ethereum application, which uh, comes up with a desire, uh, something like, okay, I need composable computations for Ethereum. I need to be I need to be able to just you know order some heavy loaded big ass computation to be able uh, to be able to use it in Ethereum. For example, some application decided that they need the result of an ML model which did scoring over different over different Ethereum addresses for the sake of, you know, figuring out risk risk parameters for some planting, all right? This is a very big chunk of computation. And uh, the application usually comes up with something like, okay, I need this chunk of computation, I need the result of this, like, ML model uh, like on Ethereum. So I'll just go, order it, somebody will generate it for me, and I will just use the result of it without being concerned that, you know, somebody tries to screw me up. So that's basically, you know, just three, it's, 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 like, it's, like, three, it's like three major actors in that. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the second thing. 
So you mentioned, okay, the maintenance of the DBMS, you know, storing the data. I mean, because in the end, right, I mean, it's a marketplace, right? And you want it to be a trustless, a decentralized marketplace. So that is run on chain. Let's say this way, uh, that is run on, that's like, that is being run on top of, uh, on top of a DBMS and, uh, this DBMS handles some BFT protocol inside of it. So there is some protocol which facilitates this. And, uh, I gotta admit that I gotta admit that the current, in the current state of it, in the current state of it, it's not maybe decentralized enough. It's become yeah, like work in progress thing, but anyway, so yeah. It is being maintained by some protocol, by, you know, yeah. There is a nuance that uh, to run this marketplace, uh, to, run the, to run this kind of thing, and uh, to run not only this marketplace, but actually like quite a lot of other different applications, like for example, uh, you got to have some very particular requirements in this protocol. Because, I mean, what is effectively proof market is, it's a lot of computation over data, but computation which can be decomposed, right? It's a lot of verifications. And verifications, I mean, you can run it on Ethereum, but if you do that on Ethereum, like directly on Ethereum, you will pay billions of dollars in fees just for the proof pocket per year. I mean, nobody wants to do that. If you run this on a rollup or something, like on a traditional rollup or something, you will you will quickly um, hit into the limit of a gas available. That's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, it's like just one proof market, just a single proof market will be enough to... Uh, induce congestion as like at any rollup existing out there. So it's like if you deploy proof market, for example, like to ZK Sake or some other rollup, it will get congested like in just seconds. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Why is the proof market so computationally intensive? Verifications, a lot of verifications. Each proof, if each proof which is being submitted by the proof generator has to be checked on the protocol side that the, that the proof generator didn't try to screw somebody up. So the, so the verification has to be done. And we have these like verifiers for EVM. So yes, I got to admit that the protocol which runs proof market is kind of EVM based one. All right. So we've put EVM inside database minimum system. So you're welcome. <laughs> Databases now have EVM inside. Anyway, so uh, you got to check each proof which is being submitted, uh, which is being submitted by the proof generator. Because otherwise, if an application comes for proof and uh, they're like, okay, well, I was like, can we be sure that it's that it, that it's good? No one knows. So we got to make sure that it's good. And uh, each pair, each circuit, each new order induces at least one verification. And just and, and just to understand verifications, I mean, they take quite a lot of gas, quite a lot of computation. So yeah, that's 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 intensive. There is also a nuance if you want. There is also a nuance if you want <laughs> that sure, sure. each proof, each proof, and uh, the input data which you use for proof generation takes uh, not just a lot of computation, but it also takes a lot of storage in terms of you got to be able to be, you got to be able to produce a lot of data. And uh, once you try to put like, for example, like a bunch of, I don't know, 500 kilobyte proofs at some rollup, it's going to get congested in seconds. If you post that much proof mm -hmm. like on, on some rollup, right? Or if you put input for the proof generation, uh, which uh, like with which, uh, the application has come, you know, to to, to the proof generator. Uh, is this will also get congested, like you know, in in seconds. For example, for example, the input for Solana consensus proof. I mean, we did Solana consensus proof some time ago. Input for Solana consensus proof is being produced. Uh, I mean, it's re it's really big. It's actually just you know thousands of thousands of signatures, thousands of hashes being produced each. I don't know, like zero point two second or something. That's a lot. I mean, that's really a lot. And for this to process all of that was like, I mean, it was it's quite convenient that we started with the DBMS because we found ourselves very lucky that we started with the DBMS. So that's basically what it is. We can process. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then you mentioned this DBMS; it still has some sort of BFT thing. So do you still have basically, you know, a bunch of different, I don't know, node operators or something similar that then all run this DBMS or? Uh, well, cur currently it looks that way. Yeah, it's like not like node operators or something, but like DBMS instance. Yeah, that it's like there are different servers, different operators which 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 do host this. Uh, but like again, right now it's just in test mode, and uh, again, it's uh, very it's uh, very important for us for this to not to accidentally become 
something you know very standalone because the majority of anybody who's interested in this, I mean, like in in in, in the DBMS, it's either accessing the Ethereum data, either generating proofs of the proof buckets for Ethereum applications, either using the either using the proof bucket in combination with some other application uh, like dedicated to Ethereum. So we try to not to be standalone and we are figuring out the way how to not end up being a standalone thing. So, yeah. We mentioned the, the three actors, so maybe let's get go through the other actors too. So we mentioned, uh, you know, we talked about the application. So can you just run through it a little bit? Let's say I'm maybe one or two examples of, like, okay, I'm someone who wants to develop an application that's going to leverage you know, ZK, how, and, and, you know, particularly like this marketplace, how would this work? Well, basically, first of all, you got to determine if you would need, if you would need uh, a, proof, a proof generation outsourcing. That's, that's like the first thing you got to determine. It's like the second thing is, the second thing you got to determine in terms of like you being as a developer, ZK application developer, you got to figure out uh, if circuit of yours is like, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's really complicated or if it requires like something, some, something huge to be proven or something, something. So the typical workflow for this, is like once you decide these two points, the typical workflow is the, well, we suppose it that way. All right. So we're kind of like protocol and tool chain agnostic, but by default, we suppose it the way. So you just come in, you take a circuit compiler, you draft some circuit. Uh, if you don't need proof generation outsourcing, you just generate locally and you just verify the Ethereum or like somewhere else and you're good. Basically, here goes your application, just build the logic, right? Uh, if you need proof generation outsourcing, you will, you, will, you will be required to basically post the circuit to the proof market as, you know, as we call it, list the circuit. <laughs> it's like listed other proof market. Here we go. Okay, God damn it. Never thought that's going to be in my vocabulary. But anyway, uh, so you're going to list the circuit on the proof market and say something like, okay, guys, now I need somebody to provide liquidity, like proving liquidity, like proof liquidity. All right. It's like all this particular circuit for this particular like circuit pair or something like this. So if you realize that, okay, yes, it needs to be outsourced. Somebody comes in, generates your proof, you get your proof, you take it, you use it anywhere else. So that's basically what it is. There's also one more scenario where you can use this is you can, it's just instead of doing all of that thing, for example, on your front end or like in a custom way from your application, like or something, you can basically order the same piece of chunk of this, like the same piece of computation right from EVM. If you're, for example, like building some EVM application, like an LD5 protocol or something, uh, you can basically just come to EVM endpoint or proof bucket, say something like, okay, I need this big chunk of computation for me at this address deployed in, I don't know, like two hours or like in five minutes or like for this amount of, I don't know, something, whatever, for this amount of ETH, for example. So you ask them, they're like, okay, well, I see the order. I'll generate it. This particular, this particular statement, here we go. Here goes a proof of yours. And you get the proof like right inside your, it's like right inside EVM, right inside your EVM application. So that's like the second, that's like the second way of uh, using this. Okay, cool, cool. And now maybe finally mention generators. So generators basically, right? They just do a bunch of computation, give back the results, get paid for it. Sounds a lot like, you know, proof of work sort of, right? Or like, is this de facto going to be that you have a lot of the crypto mining farms that maybe do like GPU mining are then just going to say, okay, now we also going to do, you know, proof production for like, let's say this marketplace, other kind of ZK systems. Or what, how do you imagine that this market is going to look like? Uh, yeah, it's like, first of all, I want to say that this might be similar. This might seem to be similar with uh, just traditional proof of, proof of work thing, but uh, there's still quite a lot of differences. It's like, uh, first of all, it's like doing just proof of work is like computing hashes over and over again for the sake of securing, for the sake of securing like some proof of work problem, right? So that's what it is. And it's not like you're proving something new each time. It's not like you're proving something, something which, uh, you know, makes sense. You're just proving hashes. And uh, that's, and these hashes are present in there just for the sake of computational complexity, for the sake of you to not to spam the cluster. So that's what it is. In case we're talking about, like, for example, ZK proof generation, uh, yes, it is required to have quite a lot of computation facility for this. Uh, there are folks which are doing, like, I don't know, specific ASICs, specific hardware, specific hardware for this. 
Some of them do programmable ASICs. Some of them do, you know, just slap thing on board and like, okay, we're good with it. And uh, that's uh, something which is similar. But what is different is that uh, what you prove is not like uh, just, you know, meaningless hashes for the sake of computational complexity. It's something you prove that you prove that basically the sequence of some actions which were done at some protocol or outside of the protocol or some or by somebody else. If you digitalize all your everyday actions, you you can you can actually create a proof of all your everyday actions. And uh, is it gonna be? It's like is it gonna be meaningless? I mean, like a proof that you cross the road, for example, or the or a proof that you I don't know something that you walked I don't know like five hundred five it's like five hundred miles, right? So. It's like, is that meaningless? Maybe, but it's like, is it, meaning, is it meaningless for everybody? Not really. It's definitely not meaningless for everybody. So this is what is different. So that's the first thing which is different. The second thing which is different uh, with, uh, just proof of work, just, with just proof of work stuff is uh, you have the same piece of computation as like uh, basically do it being done over and over again. Uh, in here, computation each time may be different. And uh, in case we're talking about like, in case we're talking about defining computations custom circuit, there are two ways of how to, how to handle this. In case circuit is the same over and over again, just like for Z, with, with DKVMs for ZK EVMs, okay? So we have the same circuit. So you got to print the same circuit over and over again with just in different input data. This situation makes sense uh, for people to produce specific, specific ASICs for this, specific hardware for this, which is dedicated to like particular circuit, right? When we're talking about that each piece of computation can be represented by different circuits, it makes sense. It, 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 it's like, it, it, it not like just makes sense, it does make sense to produce specific hardware for each of these circuits because they're not that widespread and that might be easier to just, you know, compute them on like CPU or GPU or something because these are basically like dynamic circuits and this has the system has to be more flexible. So if we're talking about like, if this market is going gonna, is gonna to end up just like, you know, mining market, no, it's not going to end up because it's not going to end up that way because it, it's it's different by design. So there may maybe there will be like some specific circuits or some specific computations that are where there's just like an enormous large demand that maybe looks more like mining, but then in general because it's much more generalized there, it it, it will be different dynamic. What are the biggest challenges with this? Like, what are, yeah, what do you guys find are the biggest, uh, maybe conceptual, technical challenges that you're facing? Which challenges do we face right now? It's like, I gotta admit that one of the biggest in terms of conceptual challenges we face currently is how to make, how to make uh, the protocol which powers proof market, uh, it's like, you know, secure and decentralized enough. I mean, how to arrange these protocols the way so it could handle proof market and similar applications. Because, I mean, again, a lot of data, a lot of computations, we cannot deploy that on the rollup. We cannot deploy that on ETH. It has, like, it has to be something interesting. It has to be like something different. And that's like one of the, that's like one of the challenges, the architectural challenges where, where it's like we, we, we're, we're thinking about right now. That's uh, in terms of, you know, like tech stuff. So we already realized that such a solution which can handle this, I mean, it has to leverage those things which come which which come from a DBMS industry. It has to leverage like it has to leverage like dynamic, dynamic sharding. It has to leverage security techniques which which were developed within crypto industry, and only the combination of those uh, would be able to handle basically what is required for this, and maybe not only for this. There is also a nuance that uh, inside the proof market, uh, like applications and like uh, proof market alike applications, right? They have to be able to access Ethereum data because the majority of what's going on around proving happens around Ethereum, and you gotta have data to put that as an input to the verifiers for each proof which comes from from a proof generator. So we basically gotta be able to be to to access Ethereum's data from the inside of a protocol, from the inside of a proof market, uh, just like it was run on Ethereum, but not on Ethereum because Ethereum cannot handle the load. So. This like weird combination, weird combination of two industries is what bothers us currently is, and it is what, in terms of like architecture, we're facing, uh, we're facing right now the most, the most challenge about. It's the, you know, how to handle this approved mark alike applications, uh, how to handle applications which require like a lot of data, a lot of computation stuff, 
transparent data access, uh, how to handle that. Um, so this could be still aligned with Ethereum. Cool. Can you talk a bit about um, what is the product roadmap? As I mentioned already, it's like there are basically like two big chunks. It's like the first big chunk is the combination of a proof market plus compiler. It's like in here, uh, in here, the thing is about putting as much applications as it's like as it makes sense for them. Uh, it's like to you know to help as much applications as possible, right? Basically, that's what it is. And uh, we target, for example, to introduce the notion of zk gaming. I mean, not just you know space invaders alike thing, just like it was with Dark Forest, right? I mean, Dark Forest is good. <laughs> I mean, I love it. Space invaders are good, but we want to introduce some more white. It's like a, a more interesting notion of zk gaming. It's like we want to be able to prove three D games. We want to be able to prove like I don't know something. Something's really weird. What happens, for example, in I don't know like three D action game like all the So that's like that's like the thing. Another thing is that uh, on our side, uh, not like not like entirely on our side, but uh, there is a ML, a ZKML extension, uh, basically coming for a, for a compiler, uh, which would allow to prove ML models to Ethereum. And uh, what I'm talking about proving ML models to Ethereum, I'm not talking about proving something like similar, something, something, uh, something trivial or something similar to, I don't know, uh, you know, just a classifier or something. I'm talking about proving uh, whatever you want, basically, because you can produce like circuits dense enough. So that's the thing. And the uh, guys which are doing this, as an example again, uh, they target to prove GPT-2 to Ethereum. Is it useful? I don't know. Is it fun? Yes, it is. <laughs> so that's what it is. Uh, that's the roadmap. That's the roadmap regarding the regarding the circuit compiler plus proof blocking. There's also a thing in the roadmap that we want to be able to produce zk EVM via zk LLVM because we think that's going to be like an important milestone for like Ethereum community because it's about the security of zk EVM circuits. We do not want anybody to get hurt by under constrained circuits. So we try to so, so we try to basically compile EVM with ZK LLVM. So we could say something like, okay guys, here goes ZK VM, which is easily auditable, which is like you know secure, which was not written manually but was generated automatically. And uh, like the compiler is kind of you know proven. So it's good, it's fine. And uh, it's definitely not under constraint and nobody nobody's gonna lose you know, nobody's going to lose any money because of that. So that's like the part around the compiler plus proof market. It's like the part around the proof market plus DBMS thing. Well, again, it's like, as I already mentioned, uh, we got to get to that point when we will be able to uh, make the protocol which powers the proof market accessible to third-party developers for people to be able to see that, okay, well, mixing two industries makes sense. That, okay, it's like, there's like, there's enough. There's enough of scalability. There is not like you know. There's there, there, there's enough of data which can be handled. There's enough computation to be which 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 can be handled, and uh, you can like leverage I don't know transparent access to Ethereum data. And currently, we're trying to make that accessible by third by by third by developers, not just us, because we've 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 already been running this in like beta mode in private for I don't know seven eight months, and uh, I mean we we want to make it public. We want to make it public for some for somebody to say that okay, it was worthwhile. It's good. It works. So, what what is the timeline here? Like, wh when do you guys go to like a mainnet, and how how do you see like if things go well? How do you see the project sort of developing over the next two years? Uh look, it's like uh, just 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 to avoid just to avoid confusion. It's like we have no such thing as we have no such thing as mainnet in terms of like you know. DBMS or something because it's it's DBMS, right? So I don't know if there is like such a thing as mainnet in that. So the second thing is second thing is uh, in terms of when the beta when the beta mode ends, like we target the beta mode to end uh, like uh, before uh, before the middle of November before Dev Connect in Istanbul. So we target to come to that event uh, having all of our verifiers having all of our like having all of our uh, endpoints and uh, everything, everything like in production deployed on Ethereum on like mainnet Ethereum, right? So if we're talking about like production or something for protocol and for DBMS, 
uh, there will still be um, quite a significant uh, time span when we're going to be testing this it's like in the public beta. And uh, it's going to run for some time. And the, so, you know, it's still, it's still going to be tested like, you know, in public. So, well, we have plans. We have plans. Uh, but it's like they're too ambitious to maybe tell about them. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me, Misha. I think this is like a really cool area of ZK and um, I think it's going to be super fascinating as we see this getting integrated in different crypto applications. Yeah. And so, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I'm excited to see how Nail Foundations and the ZK marketplace is going to play out and, and you know, how in, in general the, the impact of ZK on crypto is, is going to be. Thanks for inviting me. It's like, it was nice. It was nice. Cool. Well, thanks so much for listening, for tuning in. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, make sure to leave us an iTunes review and we look forward to being back next week.